appreciate that you have us here as a comfortable guest. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I'd like to start off with, with asking you, and I guess that's a question a lot of people like to know. What took you so long to make this new album? Um, it, it didn't take me long to make the album. It's just why was I away for a while? Um, because I could answer that in a lot of ways. Um, I was just very satisfied with what I was doing. And I didn't feel, I, I guess I don't feel that the only way I define my existence is by making records. Um, whilst I believe myself to be a very vain person, I don't believe that I'm vain in the way that I have to constantly be in the public eye uh, or constantly getting attention. You know, I'm the type of person I feel that if I'm at someone else's party um, and it's a party for them and it's their moment, for example, I'm more than willing to play a supporting role or to basically stay very quiet in the background. Um, and I don't think I'm the type of person that tries to wrestle other people's moments away from them. And then when it's my time again, then I take the center of my particular stage and then when it's not the time, I go away again because there are other things that I, I like to do and would like to do. Um, I see myself very much as two distinct people, one who is very much a public person, but that's not as much or that person isn't as large in my life as the other person. And that's the person who likes to just basically be surrounded by instruments and books and music, you know, and um, films and just, you know, occasionally women and, and just keep to myself. So you deliberately sprang off that wheel, that circus, that rock and roll circus, like tour, album tour, album tour, tour album. Well, I think also that um, the, the complete non-acceptance of, of neither fish nor flesh also gave me the perfect opportunity to just go, okay, I want to throw myself into something else. And once I did, it was just too comfortable. It was, mm. you know, um, one of the reasons why you know, this has become, one of the reasons why I feel like I'm less hungry, you know, about this. I mean, when I first came out, I was very hungry. And if I'm honest with myself, I'm not hungry in the same way. The hunger is a different type of hunger. Or let me say to you that the people that I know, like, you know, like the Madonnas and the, the Michael Jacksons of the world, are very, very obsessed people with what they do. I don't have that obsession. Um, I have a lot of ambition, but it's in a different way. My ambition is mainly musical. Mm -hmm. Whether I'm right or wrong, I labor under the feeling that I have something. Perhaps I start, I'm starting to gain something to give back to music because it's given me so much. That's what I want to do. I would like to have the success, but if I don't, it doesn't alter what I would like to do, essentially. Um, so it was just kind of, there's not this driving thing that unless, you know, that I'll always have to be right in the middle of things. You know? So could, could one say this new album is an album of appetite, not of hunger? You eat certain things you like to eat out of appetite and not out of hunger? And that's a very interesting way to put it. You know, it's a very interesting way to put it. What else, what else um, I was attempting to also express, I guess, was I love art very much, and I love music very much, and if I didn't, I would find this now very difficult to put up with, because when I first came to public attention, it was very new and exciting, but it grew very old very quickly. Mm -hmm. And by my nature, you know, um, I, th I think for the most part I have a 
keen understanding of what my basic nature is. And my basic nature, I get bored with things very quickly and, and have to move on to other things or else it's kind of like a death for me, you know. And so this whole thing, and, and what got, what got I, I began to understand that unless you find yourself to be a very simple person, if you are a three-dimensional person, which a lot of people are, some people even striving to be four-dimensional, four dimensional, um, to explain yourself to a two-dimensional medium, such as the media, it's, it's very difficult. And one dimension in the translation is always going to get lost. So, and I also came to realize how much time all of us, myself, yourself, yourself, how much time we spend, in fact, how much time we waste in trying to justify our lives to other people. And um, this is very tough for me now because you know, it's funny, I'm becoming the kind of cliché that I thought I would never become. The artist who said, listen, just listen to my music and that's really all that you need to know about me. Mm. You know, but I'm kind of becoming that because... I that. Because for me, I had the feeling when I first uh, heard your record, I saw you before on stage, but when I first uh, heard your record, the first sort of professionally done record was played like that, uh, for me it sounded like this guy had always been there. And I have the feeling it did the same thing to a lot of other people. Well, I, I do, I do notice feeling, particularly a lot of older artists who I looked up to. Um, I remember being told that that um, it, you know, there was this. Even though I was new, there was this feeling like I'd been around for a long time. Or something. I don't, I don't know how to explain that. Mm. Maybe it's some kind of spiritual thing or something. Where is that also? You feel it, is that also a part of your personality, like being like a rocket, like a, like a burnout thing? Like you tend to burn yourself out when you get interested in something? Be it art, be it um, a person, be it anything else? No, I don't know if it's a matter of burnout. I, I think if you, look at, um, if you look at the difference between a hummingbird and an eagle, for example, or a hummingbird and an owl, um, the rate of diffusion by which a hummingbird does everything is much, much quicker than mm. an owl. Um, that is not to say that the owl is any less important or any more important than the hummingbird. Hummingbirds have to eat more, far more, um, than the other birds because they burn off that much more. And literally when they go to sleep at night, because of the speed by which they live their lives, that constitutes a hibernation for them. Whereas a bear, three months, he can, he can sleep, you know. Mm -hmm. So it just depends on the nature of the animal. And I think the nature of the animal that I am, it's just that I, the rate of diffusion by which I go through ideas and things and, and passions, um, I live them that much quicker. I mean, I've, I've been accused in the past by girlfriends that, you know, you, you seem callous because if you, you know, for example, you break up, they might, be six, you know, they might be six months hurting, mm -hmm. and I might only be one month when I'm hurting. But that has nothing to do with me. That has to do with the type of animal that you are. And what they don't understand is, it's that much more condensed. Mm -hmm. So the quality of the hurt is different. Well, one person might be stretched out over three months. Right. The other person might be one month. Mm -hmm. But that one month is much more intense. Right. You know. And then it's kind of like a fire, you know, then it leaves you, you know, and then, but that's just kind of the way it is. So that has its advantages, that has its disadvantages, and but there's nothing I can do but accept it, you know. Um, so I, I wouldn't call it burnout, it's just the, you know, I go through books the same way, you know, I go through music the same way. Can you um, remember the, the exact or specific thing that brought you back? brought back your interest in doing music in public? I guess you never quit doing music for yourself, but you know... No, I, in fact, sometimes what I find dangerous about me is that there, there, is, there is a very, there are very thin strings that keep me really attached to this. It's like, you know, it's like when people have 
maybe near death experiences or something, when they kind of are forced to see how illusional our priorities are in the life that we live, um, after that they can never see life the same way again. And it's hard to have the same attachments over things that you used to put so much emphasis on when you see that those things aren't really that important. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, people say, but yes, but, you know, what about making music? I'm always making music. Um, sometimes, I mean, there's songs, for every song that you hear from me, there's like another ten songs that I have that you, that you haven't or might not hear. Mm -hmm. um, there's a hummingbird there. They always hear. I love them. Um, sometimes I'm content to sing it to myself in the shower. And sometimes I accept that if I release this to the public that they wouldn't, they wouldn't accept it or wouldn't want it or wouldn't understand it or wouldn't like it. But it gives me something. And I you know, also have a studio, so I'm also aware. And there's even, to some degree, a slightly romantic notion that I have that after, you know, it's sometimes only when you're gone that people can fully appreciate what you, what you might have meant whilst you were mm -hmm. there. Because, especially now, I mean, you can't blame people, the, the, the fans. I mean, even since I first came out, there's so much more music much more music available. There's so much music available that it's inevitable. A lot of it is just bound to be lost. But the pro in one way that's good, but then it's bad at the same time. I mean, I don't mean to sound elitist, but I don't mean... It's, sometimes it's too easy mm. for artists to get deals nowadays. And sometimes that can be a bad thing because inevitably, when there's so much available, People wind up trying to conform to what they think is the accepted thing, and that takes away people's desire, an artist's desire to, to etch his own identity onto his record and stand out as his own creation, or as you know, with a, a fervent desire to be his own or her own creation, um, because the risks are that much greater. And by nature, most human beings are, are conformists. Mm -hmm. So. It's kind of difficult. I mean, I don't really believe that there's less talent now than there was in the heyday of the 60s or anything. I just believe that, you know, with anything, that's like saying um, 25 years ago, why were there more varieties of fl beautiful flowers? You know, nature never... I think in general, all possibilities are always available. I do think, though, you know, obviously life is seasonal, so you do have moments of, or seasons of harvest in seasons of, of barrenness. However, I think for the most part, what's missing is is the, the encouragement, the um, the cultivation. Mm -hmm. You know, another person can come here and have this this house, and all of all of a sudden the flowers don't look as lovely anymore because they're not being cultivated. But they still have the same potential to be beautiful flowers. You know, I just that's the sad part is just really how much the music industry has deteriorated to become more industry and, and less music and it, it just kind of, I, I have to tell you honestly, it's kind of really tough to be an artist, mm. you know, um, in the way that I see an artist. So it's kind of, it frightens most people away who have, who really want to stand out above the pack and do something unique to themselves. Mm. As much as I appreciate what you're saying, really personally as well, not like from a professional point of view, I mean, I agree in you personally, 100%. Um, it seems to me that you have had some kind of spiritual um, adventure, or not, let's not call it adventure because that puts it down a little bit, but uh, an, ex an experience of some kind that changed your mind drastically or dramatically. Could you pinpoint that, or do you want to pinpoint it in front of the camera? Um. First of all, the word adventure is not to be um, found upon. I mean, life invariably is an adventure. Um, I think essentially my life was designed to kind of 
see things more in a philosophical or spiritual way to some degree because, well, you know, I have my father's a bishop and my mother's father was a, a pastor. And though I'm not a religious person, obviously, you know, I was born to those people for some reason, you know, perhaps. Um, suffice to say that I, I, I have had things happen to me, but they didn't just start happening. They've kind of been happening since I was a child. Mm -hmm. And it's just perhaps been that in the last few years, I'm starting to gain an understanding of what has been happening. And I'm buffering those examples perhaps less and accepting them more for what they are. I, I think essentially um, the great lesson of all of our, all of our lives and existences is acceptance. And that's, that's both very beautiful and it's both very, really dramatically tough and difficult because in a lot of ways we're designed to feel that we can tamper and control and essentially there's so much, you know, we, that's one of our biggest illusions, I believe, is that we can control things. Essentially things happen to us mm -hmm. and what we do essentially is react to them. But we tend to feel that, we, you know, if things are going our way, I'm um, controlling things. If things are not going our way. I've lost control. Essentially, I don't know if we, we ever really have control over much of anything tangible or real. Um, I think the breakthroughs that a lot of people make are when they just lay back and accept that really nothing I can do except do the best I can do um, in my personal life and in trying to understand um, the way things are. I mean. Again, I think part of the man's dilemma is if I have friction with you, that I will try to, I will actually do, labor under the, the delusion that I can change you. Mm -hmm. Essentially, I cannot change you. I cannot change you. Only, not only can, can you do that, but you can't even change most of you. There's very little you can even tamper with, you know what I mean? With, your, with, oneself. with oneself, because essentially one is designed the way one is. But obviously you have changed for yourself. But so. I don't believe that I have. I think what happens is... You just dug up what was there anyway? I think essentially one starts to... T we, I think we essentially have two main pieces. We have our real selves. Mm -hmm. Some people say the essence. Some people say, I'll say, let's say, for example, your basic nature. And then we have acquired habits and traits that we kind of learn, that we inherit or learn from other people. And I think one is your real self and one is kind of the, the, the mask or the false self. And that is just as valuable because you need that. But essentially, you know, outside I have my car and it's got a car cover on it. You know, and if constantly that's the only way you see it, you can think, well, that's what it is. Then you pull it away and you see that, no, this is what it is. But it was always under there, you know. Right. So I didn't, I didn't go abracadabra and change what was under there. Um, I don't really think that I've changed who I am. I think one goes through a period where if one is lucky enough, one allows oneself to truly become who one truly is. Um, and that's a process that could take really the m most of our lives to complete that particular process. What I'm saying though is, I can't change you. You can't even change most of you because that you're designed to be a certain way, whether you like it or not. And I think the the, the great leap or the great step is ac accepting that and accepting me, accepting you the way you are. And I think one, once one does that, slowly some understanding starts to come, and then it goes to a larger picture. Mm -hmm. You know. But don't you think, like for instance, in a relationship, when like both parts realize what you were just saying? that eventually they change one another in, be, in merging, just by merging, just becoming maybe something like something, some overlord third above the two? I think essentially, look at it this way, um, we tend to see it like that, but you would never be attracted to someone that you have no possibility of being let me put that, well, what I'm trying to say is, it would appear that way. Oftentimes what is interesting about relationships between two people is that another person can act as a mirror to show you things about yourself that otherwise you would not have the 
ability to see. That allows you to have a more accurate reflection of yourself by which to look at yourself slightly more objectively. Mm -hmm. Then by doing that, you can then make adjustments according to what is capable of you. Mm -hmm. um, but you can never become something someone wants you to be, different from what you are. All you can do, it, all we can do at best is modify the things about ourselves that perhaps are kind of sticking, standing in the way between a successful union between two people and try to accommodate the other person likewise. But if a person wanted you to be a more of this type or that type, if that wasn't in you to become, you could not be that. Mm -hmm. And trying to be that would actually cause you more harm towards any kind of real progress um, than good. So that's why people tend to be attracted to certain people. Mm -hmm. you, you're not attracted to just anyone in the way of, I mean, maybe your penis is, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But as far as your heart, there's a reason why the heart is attracted to certain people, because certain people, we seem to perhaps have an unconscious understanding that certain people um, are beneficial for any kind of tangible progress towards becoming who we essentially are as opposed to other people, you know. I mean, believe me, I've had many experiences where people, whether it's a relationship or whether it's the media or whether it's a manager or whatever, trying to change essentially who I am. And all that ever results is great friction. Mm. Um, you wind up leaving those people because you can't really change the way they see things either. So you shake their hands and you move onward. Sasha has a lot of questions too. I'll hand it over. Um, moving, yeah. What made you relocate to Los Angeles? You said a couple of years ago that, that um, you were never going to move back to America compared to making love to an old, to a former lover. So you kissed the old lady again, now? Um. First of all, I never, when I when I did come back here, I didn't come back here to like live permanently or anything. I, I came for the main reason of getting away from London for a while, and also just I don't know I don't know I don't know why. Well, actually, I know why I picked Los Angeles. I was going to go to Italy, and I just thought I would just be far too comfortable there. And the only real option for me, if I wanted to give this another shot, legitimately, was America, um, if not England. The only option, therefore, was New York and Los Angeles, and I don't see myself necessarily as a Los Angeles person, but I don't see myself as a New York person either. I felt that Los Angeles has places like this where you can kind of not even really um, be noticed, give your place a hideaway. Also though, um, sometimes the problem of our youth is that we, you know, you're like 24 years old or 25 years old, and you haven't even lived, but you think you know everything. You know, and we oftentimes make grand, bold pronouncements about things that we will and won't do, having no idea that a year, or two, three, four years later, we might feel differently. And the, and the worst part about it is that, particularly when you're in this type of profession, people will never let you forget what you said three or four years ago. Pete Townsend still answers questions along the lines of, well, you said many years ago that I hope I die before I get old. But this is what he said at 18, and an 18-year-old probably feels like this. How could he possibly know at 18 how he was going to feel at 40? And, you know... And vice versa. I mean, it's very hard when you grow old to really see the way you felt at that time. It's because really you hard forget. To, you forget, you of forget. course. You have your own mercy with that, with, with yourself, but people aren't merciful in that sense, are they? Sorry. Um, uh, just to get this over with, how did you feel posing naked for Pew Magazine? You know, that that was something that, you know, and again, what I find, what I, what I accept, one of the things I accept, we were talking about accepting, I have come to accept that most people will not understand me. And it's an illusion, and it's folly for me to think that I can get people to understand me just because I explain myself. Um, however, I feel that I am engaged in a process whereby I am trying to redefine and recondition myself. I don't mean redefine myself as far as my public image. I've come to realize within myself 
how much we essentially just basically are programmed by our societies, by our cultures, to be what we are. And I guess I decided that I reject that, and I want to remake myself in the image of what I want to be, in the way that I feel that my heroes did. Um, I feel that there are certain people that I look up to who got to that point. Some of them very obvious, and some of them not so obvious. People like... Uh, I don't know people like Walt Whitman and Gurdjieff and, and Goethe and um, Buddha or Jesus. I mean, not, not, not just in a religious sense, because we, essentially I don't see these people as, as a person. religious yeah. people. I mean, just, you know, in the way that a lot of people wound up doing. Um, and it's, it's, it's funny because part of that seems to be doing things that you never thought you would do or that you were conditioned not to do. You know, like I said, I grew up in a very, very strictly religious background. And the idea of me posing naked was completely anathema to the way that I was raised. Therefore, for me, it was even more important than I do it. I certainly didn't do it um, because I felt I needed to. And when people would say, well, but what about, you know, your credibility? And I, I think, as far as I understand, um, credibility has never been a problem for me. And, and if it was, I can't worry about those things. Um, and I was surprised when it was first suggested to me how quickly I said yes. I didn't really even have to think about it. And that surprised me how quickly I said yes. Because it just seemed to me symbolic of yet another step towards that direction that I want to do things. I want to remake myself in my image, in the image that I want to be, not in the image that I was kind of given, you know, by my parents, by my society, by my culture, by my community. So I felt it was somehow symbolic for me to do it. And I remember um, the day of the shoot saying to them, make sure you have a couple bottles of wine available um, because I would probably need it. And the two things that I remember was that the girl who was picked to do the, the um, thing with me, she was very helpful because she was just a very um, one of those type of real free-spirited people who was very up for the assignment, you know, and that really put me at ease. And um, secondly, I remember once I finally completely stripped all my clothes off, that after about 10 or 15 minutes, how completely natural it all felt. It just felt like it just made total and complete sense. What What do I have to hide? What is my shame? What am I ashamed of? Nothing that I haven't inherited. I've inherited a shame. And I reject that shame because it is not my shame. It is the shame of someone else who perhaps couldn't handle that part of their existence. Um, you know, here it is. It's just a dick, you know. Um, and I was born this way. And essentially, I will die this way. And, you know, I, it just kind of felt symbolic to me in a way that I don't know that I can completely, uh, you know. Um, if you go through everything you've been through in the media, um, you started out as a big mouth saying, I'm a genius, I'm greater than God. Then uh, with the second album, you had this Jesus photo. And uh, now this, is that a master plan or is it some sort of therapy you're doing with yourself? I don't really know that, um, the first thing explaining these things, um, it was actually a German gentleman who asked me a couple months ago, it seems like I don't take myself as seriously as I did before. And I said, what I think what you don't understand is I never took myself that seriously. You guys took me very seriously. And what has been at least very reassuring for me is to find out that it seems to be a lot of people now who, because of the distance now in time, can look back at a lot of stuff and see that I wasn't really all as serious as they thought I was at the time. I mean, even the context in which I said I am a genius was a complete, you know, and I, and I, I, I would be honest with you about those things because I don't feel like essentially I have anything to be ashamed of, but it was said as a complete joke. Um, and me and the person who asked the question both laughed when we said it. But I'm, I was so naive at the time that I didn't realize that particularly I find English journalists don't do what 
um, American journalists have a tendency to say things like, and he said, jokingly, dot, dot, dot. In England, that n never really happened for some reason. So German journalists do that too. I mean, I do it. And you can be very sure of that. I'll try my very best to get every quote and yota and every notion across. But I see that just vice versa to fall into your word. Because um, when people were saying at that time, they took you serious with quotes like that. I mean, in what state of mind are they? Well, this is kind of, Sorry. for me... Sorry. Excuse me. Sorry. Um, you used to live in Germany quite for quite a while. Uh, did you ever experience racism in Germany? Um, I think because essentially human beings are the same the world over, at least in there are only a certain number of basic types, it's inevitable that um, no matter where you go, you're going to experience something like that. But to be honest with you, I felt more comfortable in Germany um, than I did in America. So um, I felt that the, uh, the racism in Germany was more honest. And I appreciated that more. So um, I find the racism here to be more dishonest. Well, what do you mean by that? Sorry, sorry. Can I, in, in order not to get something like um, a male Jesus or something like that, what is honest racism? Can yeah, that's what I wanted to know. What is what honest racism? What I mean racism? is that, well, I found that in Germany, if someone didn't like you, and you sensed that it was because of you know, whatever your color, or your nationality. It was very open and very honest. It wasn't some kind of concealed, the way we tend to do it. My grandmother used to say that she preferred the South to the North in, in America because she felt that Southerners were more honest. And if someone didn't like you, you knew right away. So there wasn't in the North, people perhaps make you feel that they care about you or, or their friend, you know, or, and they say great things to your face and then go behind your back and completely try to block any sort of progress, for example. Coming from that type of background, I found that it more refreshing because I felt it was more immediate and more honest, that you didn't therefore waste your time um, with people that you perhaps thought was one thing and they turned out to be another. And I actually appreciated that. Um, Mention in Germany. Not to say that I appreciated the racism, but I appreciated at least that it was an honest racism as opposed to the type of sometimes Machiavellian uh, racism that can exist here in the States, for example. But I, I, to be honest with you, I never ran into a lot of it. You know, um, people ask me, when people ask me, you live in, you know, when you say, you live in Germany, and they always like, express surprise. For the most part, I enjoyed my years in Germany, and I'm very grateful for what I learned there. Um, for the most part, I didn't have any problems. Now, of course, that's different from what is going on apparently now, but um, one thing I try to do, even though it's not always easy, and even though a lot of people don't understand it, I think in general, we tend to have a tendency um, particularly those of us who have mic microphones thrust in our face, to appear that we are eloquent and knowledgeable about everything, um, and that we must have an opinion about everything. Quite frankly, I don't really know that much about what's going on in Germany except the basic outline of what I'm told or what I read. For me to comment would perhaps be desirable to a lot of people who like to hear me say something, perhaps profound. The fact of the matter is, and I don't really know that much right now about what's going on except what I hear from other people or what I hear in the news in the media. It be, it's tempting to try to comment on what's happening or what should be done, but maybe I don't really know anything about it, you know. But also suffice to say that it's such a complex issue, what I can glean from it, that simple answers are, aren't ever going to suffice. And unfortunately, we live in such a black and white world, and I think if there's any influence, negative influence, that Europe has gotten from America, is to expect very quick, very fast, easy answers to solutions, I mean, to questions that have been... Let me put it to you like this. If you look at the way Western medicine tends to, to work, Western medicine works on the principle of suppressing the illness or the disease, whereas 
ancient or homeopathic or different types of medicines might have taken longer and they tried to deal with the cause so it might have taken longer to get to the cause and in the meantime you might have had to suffer more but our culture the emphasis on doing anything but suffering we do not want to suffer we, do, we want everything easy and we don't want to pay the price for it the solution to the problem that exists uh, is not easy and it's never going to be easy it is a, a chronic problem that has existed as far as I understand it in the culture for very very many years and perhaps it's never been honestly dealt with and perhaps until it is honestly dealt with all you can keep doing is trying to suppress it and anything that you suppress must find some other outlet because that's the natural law the reaction to it. exactly that's so right. I, so you mean to say um, let me interrupt you there because it, it applies to the political system right now in Germany that you once if you suppress this latent racism which is there then it has the outburst on the one hand that people burn others and that it they get really vicious and, and violent and stuff like that do you think so well I think it's like this Look at how America deals with we try to deal with crime. Or we think that actually because someone has killed another person, that if we kill them, that it's somehow going to solve something. We, we also have a problem that we never want to honestly look at what the problem could be. If someone puts a brick through my window, no, of course I don't like this, but it behooves me to understand why. Why did he do this? Because until I understand why, what possible progress can be made towards understanding why these impulses tend to come out of people. Um, the fact that I don't agree with the attacks that are made on people doesn't alter the fact that there has to be some understanding. Why, why do you feel this way? There must be some dialogue. Until people understand what essentially is the problem, how can any tangible solution be gathered? To say that these people are evil or that they're wrong or that this or that again professes to some degree an impatience and an ignorance that is completely and entirely human. However, it's never going to, you're never going to understand the problem. You're only understanding the results. And it just seems something that is not going to be a quick, easy solution. I mean, I, don't, I guess part of it is predicated on the belief that life to some degree has to be seen as school. And why else are we here? I mean, some people maybe think we're here just to have it easy and have it peaceful and never be troubled by anything that essentially forces us to look at ourselves honestly. If it wasn't for friction or hardship, we would just tend to stay nestled in our comfortable little sleep. And that without these things or these events, we never really perhaps see quote-unquote reality. You know, whether I agree or disagree with you, if you have a, a grievance or a big issue or problem with me, it behooves me to understand why. I might never agree, but I have to understand why. Because I don't think, therefore, any progress can ever be made unless I do. So I think just trying to put a whole bunch of people in jail and stamping it out, I think in the meantime there are short-term measures that can be taken in any situation to try to make sure that more people aren't harmed, that more people aren't hurt, or more people aren't killed. This is obvious that this needs to be done. But if we think that just by locking people up or throwing them in jail, the problem is going to go away, that is the same mistake Western medicine makes, that by treating and suppressing the symptoms, that the illness is going to come away. No, in fact, it only tries to find another outlet to come out even stronger, because it's been that much longer in the body and has gained even more strength. And um, I also think that it seems, and again, this is just my own um, theory, because Okay. Also, I seem to be under the impression that besides some of it coming seemingly from East Germany, um, I think one thing is it seems that East Germany is so much younger now in comparison to West Germany that they have growing pains that they have to, it is inevitable that they go through. Also, it seems that a lot of it is a youth thing because youth naturally rebels against something that it is forced to accept. And what do I mean by that? I mean to say that, for the most part, I can't see that guilt serves a tremendous purpose. Um, guilt, in a lot of ways, is a buffer between truly understanding why a problem exists. Um, 
a man can do something, feel terribly guilty for it, and the guilt alone can blind him to trying to search for why did I do that? As opposed to, I'm really sorry, 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 sorry. I think, and again, this is a shot in the dark here, but my, re my feelings are that because of it, the guilt that a lot of um, a generation of Germans felt after what happened when, uh, during World War II, it was just kind of maybe in a way overdone. And a lot of young people, rightly or wrongly, just kind of look, fuck that, it's not our problem, it's yours. And sometimes we, we learn from the young, not necessarily how they do things, but in what they're trying to express. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a child will naturally rebel against a the parent, they feel it's like putting too much pressure and authority on them. And what does that show us? That perhaps we are putting too much pressure and authority on them and we need to lighten up. That teaches them one thing and it teaches us another thing. Um, all I'm trying to say is essentially it's a very complex problem that has to be honestly dealt with and until it's honestly dealt with, it's going to be a recurring chronic problem. Right. But do you understand why many people hate you because of your color, not because of what you are, who you are, just because the fact that you are black? Can you understand that? Well, first of all, I operate on the assumption that this does exist because for the most part, I've, I've not really had much experience with abject hatred because I'm, because I'm black. However, I remember a few years ago, if someone had come up to me and said, you know, you nigger bastard or whatever, it would have really hurt me. If I'm honest, if someone said that to me now, it wouldn't tend to hurt me as much as it would provoke in me a sense of compassion for them. Because what that would show me was that there is something in them that I desire so troubling, or so problematic, or so limited, that they are suffering on some level, far greater than I am. Now, of course, they they kill or they hurt me or bomb that hurts me on a physical level, obviously. But but still, you know, and I'm making no attempt here to be anything other than coming from where I am. Do you know what I mean? Because anything else is bullshit. And, and life is too short for bullshit unless it's bullshit for other people's amusement. In which case they should know that it's bullshit. You know. But you know, look at this. I mean, even even on a cross, man, you know, again, I'm not religious. And, uh, and I appreciate people like Jesus not because of Christianity. In fact, I appreciate him in spite of Christianity. But because I truly believe that this was a man who, who turned himself into, as Nietzsche said, a superman. Um, but even on the cross, he kind of looked, he said, you know, forgive them for they really don't know what they're doing. And essentially, that's the way I would tend to look at it. I see a lot of racism, I believe, is built on ignorance, is built on fear. I think particularly in my experience, a lot of white a lot of white black racism is directly connected to the myth of black male sexual superiority. And I believe that because men in general, all of us, have such fragile psyches compared to women. And I think because unfortunately so much of our identity is tied into our dicks that that's a very potent fear. And I think that fear causes a lot of the friction that exists between specifically black and white men. But could you say that you dropped or tried to drop somebody else's fear by opposing nude? No, that had nothing to do. I wasn't trying to take on but the problems of the world. Of that point, isn't it? I was just doing something because, you know, um, that's what I wanted to do. But, you know, the point I'm trying to make is I think, again, Nothing is as simple as, you hate me just because I'm black. I think that is, again, a symptom. I think that the problem, a lot of times, is based on fear, based on misunderstanding, based on ignorance. Um, and I think a lot of it even goes deeper. We do have a lot of issues on our unconscious or subconscious level. I think a lot of it is also, I mean, you'd have to, I guess, you believe essentially in the collective unconscious. I know that Jung seemed to believe in that, and I seem to agree with him on a certain level. And I think that um, on a collective unconscious, a lot of what we're taught about white history is simply not true, and it's simply bullshit, for lack of a better word. And I think that there is a part of us that when we're living kind of, if you build your house on a bed of lies, it's very easily threatened, as, as opposed to if you're building your house on something that's very, very solid. I mean, 
you know, the whole story of the three little pigs seemed to suggest that the guys who made the house of straw was far more threatening than the guy whose house was made of brick. And um, I just feel there's a lot of little issues, the, the sexual issue, the, the, the historical issue. You know, it's, your culture has been predicated on the belief, part of it, that you are superior to all the other races, whether that's true or false, blah, blah, blah. That is part of what your history has been predicated on. And I believe because it's kind of so shaky, such a shaky proposition and tenet, it is easily provoked and threatened. And I mean, that's just like little, I could be completely talking out of my ass. Um, I just, obviously, being black, I have had to think about these things in a way that perhaps the average white person hasn't, because it behooves the chicken to know the ways of the fox. Obviously, because his, his, so, his life depends on him understanding the fox. The fox doesn't need to understand the chicken. All he needs him to feel is to feel hungry and know that if he corners him, he can eat him. You know, my grandmother used to say that black people knew white people in ways that white people didn't know themselves because they didn't have to, you know. Um, whereas black people had to understand white people, their survival depended upon it. So, um, I, I just find it hard. I don't know if I've ever really hated anything in my life, and on some level I find it difficult to understand hate. I've certainly been annoyed and pissed off and very angry, you know, but I just don't know that that's a part of my basic nature. But as God is my witness, I, I tend to feel compassion for those people. I, I don't think the answer is, if you hit me, I hit you back harder. It depends on what the point is that we're trying yeah. to make. If the point is, is that if you hit me, I'll hit you back. So as to prevent you from hitting me again, um, was it to teach you that there will be consequences of your doing so? That's one thing. But in the feeling that it's going to eradicate your initial impulse for hitting me, that's misguided. You know, I just believe, particularly in our country, blacks and whites have never really had an honest dialogue with one another. Every time it seems that something has happened to force them to talk, again, there's always a, a suppression. The blind is pulling it down again. You know, and I. I know in Europe, one of the things that I picked up in Germany, again, was that I learned more about black history in Germany than I ever did in America. And that's very interesting. I also learned that with my friends there, I could talk about these things without seeming to threaten them. I find that as a generality in America, once a black person starts talking to a white person honestly about this, there's a natural defensive mechanism that comes up. And then before you realize it, they're arguing. You know, and it's, it's, we have to honestly, it ain't going to be pain free, you know. Um, but because we want it to be, we're probably going to constantly run into the same problem. Could it be that you're sort of standing between the lines as you're not really black and not really white? Well, see, in America, that, that's not allowed to exist because if you have even. Uh, some I mean, for you personally, as an individual. Um, I don't know, but you know what? Maybe the times call for that. You know, maybe the times call for, you know, obviously, um, mixed heritage people are not in the great minority that they used to be. It's becoming less a phenomenon, I mean, less a sort of like rare thing and more of a common thing. So perhaps in nature's infinite wisdom, we might be part of the solution to a problem, but we could also be more of a problem. I, I don't know. Mm. Sorry, I feel we've, we've talked enough politics for now, don't you? I mean, Life is nothing but politics. I know, but uh, I'd rather be talking some Believe more. Believe me, you know, the, the music business is everybody's political. Business. I know, I know exactly. I've been long, en I've been long enough into it, but uh, I'd like to talk a bit more about your music since I think I feel the time, our time is being up, or is up. Well, I'd you can talk about the music. Yeah. Or you can talk about Okay, we can split <laughs> every other thing. Anyway, but uh, I wanted to b get to know a bit more about the actual process of making this album. Not like, you know, sitting in a studio and doing it, but... Uh, Not very how exciting. You I know that, I, I know that bit. But how you chose the, the songs for this album. You said uh, in the beginning of, the, of our talks, you said that um, uh, for every song on the album, there's at least ten um, people might never hear of, at least. So, how did you actually choose the ones you, you then picked? 
Is that? I don't. I don't really know. I don't. I I I felt. I feel kind of guided. Now, when I say that, I don't mean like by some kind of higher force. It, it just could be just some part of myself that knows better than I do, and then I just submit to that. Um, I just trust. I just go by impulses and feelings. I. You know, it's like when he asked why did I come to L.A., I don't know. I've just always found myself at the right place at the right time. Another person can say, well, not according to my judgment, but that's always the way I found myself. It's always in the right place at the right time. <clears throat> and I've always trusted my instincts, and I've always felt rewarded by my instincts. Now somebody can say, well, what about your last album? Well, first, I feel that I felt then, and I feel now that in ways that I can't even explain, the last album was a watershed for me as an artist and as a person. That I went through things that I otherwise wouldn't have gone through that I think has inherently increased my understanding of myself and of some, to some degree, the world around me. I'm extremely, I'm extremely grateful for that. And it's provided me with a certain amount of friction that a part of me would prefer not to have. But if I didn't have it, I would just be way too comfortable in my existence and never really have any impetus by which to propel my desire for understanding greater. Um, and, and like I said, is that part, and then I don't believe this album could possibly have existed without the strides I felt I made as an artist on the last one. Um, so I, I've always trusted my instincts. Mm. And the more you trust them, the stronger they get. Suppose people misunderstand this album too like they misunderstood the other one before. What will happen of you personally? Um, per personally, I would probably be driving one car instead of two. I would probably have one residence as opposed to two or three locations. Um, my lifestyle would be affected to a degree that I couldn't possibly fly as many places first class. But essentially, all that with assault would be my vanity. It wouldn't essentially touch anything real. Um, and it would force me to therefore reevaluate whether I wanted to continue in the music business because I al already find the music business quite unsavory. Um, Knowing all that, you must be very sort of cool about the whole thing. You seem so. Well, one thing that surprised me is how unafraid I was when I was making this record. I, I even thought before I started that I was going to be very nervous because a lot was riding on this to some degree. I, I'm amazed at how unaffected I was by any sense of fear, you know, mm. I just kind of, there's nothing I can do except do the best I can and try to work as hard as I can to, I mean, I don't like promotion, but I do it because I feel that I have some obligation to Sony. Um, and I mean, you know, they, money isn't, even though they have more money than it seems one company should have, still it's, 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 um, it doesn't grow on trees, and uh, I feel like you have some obligation to, you know, participate in in because uh, it also benefits me as well, and uh, that's why I do that. You know what I mean? So, I, and also to give my music the best chance because uh, you know I I would like as many people to hear it as possible, not for the financial benefit, but because essentially why are we doing this? Why are we risking public humiliation the way we do unless we want it? people to hear what we do. Um, but it seems that the, na the nature of my life so far has been one of extremes. I am by nature a gambler and by nature a risk taker. And when I win, I win big. And when I, when I flop, I flop big. Um, so if, if, people, if people don't accept the record, uh, I don't know whether I would have because I find the business so unsavory as it is, I don't know if I would have the heart to put myself through the business again. Maybe I would just um, use my studio, make as many records as possible, and then one day when maybe it would happen that, you know, if, if I'm dead or something, that the interest would be there again because we're, we're, kind, of, we're kind of vultures like that, all of us. Somebody dies and all of a sudden we go, you know, fuck, what did they do? You know, what, maybe I should check them out now. You know, and the point is, as long as the music gets eventually heard, that comes through me. That's the most important thing. If it doesn't happen in, in the time that I would want, that's a little bit of unfortunate, <coughs> an unfortunate thing for me. But you know, I don't have any control over that, really. 
We talked a lot about your your own personal spirituality, and uh, if I may say so, I feel a lot of it. Do you uh, mind showing us your house? Because I have the feeling it oozes this. Well, I will show you certain things, but I will make it proviso that it's not really my house. I'm, um, but you live here. And I, I obviously have the feeling that you do that. I don't. I don't know. I, I don't even know what belongs to you personally or what not. But everything, a lot well, of things, seem I, I to fit to you. I just want to say that because, like I said, part of part of my basic nature is I am pretty vain, and, and I'm pretty much like I don't want people to think certain things are mine that aren't mine that I personally wouldn't have in my house. But um, but that's my own little problem, and it's like. But so I'll show you the things that mean something to me. Okay. Most of my stuff is pretty much in storage, anyway. Um, I think a couple of years ago you brought out a single in England under a different name. Is that maybe something you would do after, if, fingers crossed, this album would flop? Um, I'm not. I'm not ashamed of my name sufficiently enough to, to like want to take another one. I would perhaps look towards doing something else. Myself and, um, myself and, well, I don't know what to um, me and Prince have been thinking for a while about doing a project together, but, and, and also myself and Lenny have been thinking for a while, Lenny Kravitz, about doing a project together, but the force of my artistic ego alone wouldn't allow me to do that unless I felt it was, I was at a position where it didn't appear that I needed either of those two people. Um, I don't think I could, I would rather not do anything and do something that would be interpreted that I did that as a career move or that I needed those people. Um, it's just that ever since I left my first band, The Touch, I'm obviously, um, there are obvious advantages to being a solo artist, such as, you know, especially since I'm my own producer, I don't really have to answer to anything but my own musical impulses. But I also realized that if I were in a band, some of the things that I said in the past uh, wouldn't have gotten nearly me into nearly as much trouble because for some reason people in bands can get away with a lot more than people who are by themselves. Um, plus, though I don't collaborate on my own stuff, I do have a natural collaborative um, thing, I think, that I could work well with other people. So I'd like to do a project like that, but only if the uh, circumstances were the people were either on equal footing or it wasn't seen that it was a, a cynical career thing. Mm -hmm. The thing in England was just, again, a false sense of security. Part of the reason why Neither Fish Nor Flesh wasn't set up in the way that it should have been in the marketplace was that both myself and Sony at the time felt that having sold that many records the first time gave us a certain freedom that we mistakenly thought we had earned. When after one album, I guess we, we were wrong. We were wrong. Um, I don't regret even remotely the music, but I would have done things differently as far as how we put it out. And um, that song is a regret for me because I really, really like that song, The Birth of Marty, but n not enough people really heard it, even though I think at the time when it was released, they did a survey at Radio 1, and like something like 95 out of 120 people thought it was not only going to be a hit, but they knew who it was. But I think there were a lot of people who were really offended by the fact that I would dare to do something like that. Mm -hmm. I think the music industry has definitely lost its sense of humor. And so many people now take it so seriously that God forbid that you should do something like that. You know, who does he think he is? Well, I learned my lesson. Um, if it's, you can't force feed anyone anything if they're not willing to accept it. It's not the public. You've got to first get through the industry. They're the great barrier between us and the public. And if they don't accept it, you have to find the clever animal feel, finds another way to kind of go about doing their thing. Mm -hmm. um, there's still situations where, again, take uh, myself and many as a class example, there's still situations where if a magazine is giving them a cover or giving me a cover, they're not going to turn around in the next few months and give it to me. Um, but obviously our exception, that's just an example. Um, it's kind of like with the members at the same time. Um, well, that's because they have the same management for a certain time. They're, they're yeah, but also because they, they realize that by not clashing, they get both together with the one. It almost makes sense to do that with some of the other people in a similar situation as far as the way they market it. Because 
you know, it's, if it can be avoided next time, I will try to avoid it. Simply because it just then gives those people more space. Only because this is, um, it's a reality of the industry, of the media, that that's the way it is. You know, you, it does no good to rail and say, is it fair or it's unfair? It's just the way it is. You know, because a lot of times, you know, a magazine can say, well, we just don't sell it unless it's a very quote unquote important or famous black person. We just don't sell as many copies as if we have a white face or a blonde girl or something in color. Um, it's just so, so deeply into the people. It is. Deep. It's it been is. a couple so of it's not, years. So it's not a magazine's fault. If, yeah. if, if there's, you know, obviously, if they never did it, then it's like, well, why do you do this? But if it's a reality, it's a reality. So the more, the more likely you are to be able to push your agenda through. So it's kind of selfish that essentially, if there are more people kind of doing a certain thing, there's more chance that what you do, no matter how different, it's going to be accepted. And the more it wasn't, and I'm certain that there are people who are trying to feel that, either because they think it would be very interesting, or they think it might sell papers or whatever. Um, it's but easier as well because it's easier to categorize than you know. Like sure. It's got to be that way. Mm -hmm. If two of the kind make the same kind, it got to be like. The funny thing is that I, I bought the Rolling Stone this morning, and uh, then he calls naked for the Rolling Stone. <laughs> There's a two-page uh, post uh, picture of him black and white. You can't see anything, but interesting. Just struck. Yeah, and sometimes, it's sometimes things are coincidence. I mean, sometimes it sounds to me like a very good remake of Papa's Got a Brand New Bag. Right. Yeah. yeah. yeah.